All right, I am going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we have about an hour here um, in our Liquid Margins 47 session. So I believe that other attendees will be joining, but I don't want to, um, I want to respect everyone's time. Uh, thank you for joining for Liquid Margins 47. This session is best practices for elevating RSI and student grades. And this is part of Hypothesis uh, Liquid Margins series, which is a great podcast series. We have many wonderful episodes on our YouTube channel and our website. So um, if you find that this is interesting to you, you may want to check out our other topics um, from previous months and years. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, we do not have chat enabled for this session, but we do have Q&A enabled. So if you have a question, we would love to hear it. Um, just go ahead and drop your question in the Q&A section in the bottom navigation bar, and we will be responding to questions. Um, and you can join in and respond to others' questions as we move through this session. So we, we do invite audience participation in that way. And if you have questions about any of that, uh, feel free to pop that into the Q&A as well. There is also a closed captioning setting. You can enable it via the CC icon in the Zoom menu located at the bottom of your screen. And I will go ahead and begin with our session, uh, which I know all of you are here for. So just um, to introduce uh, myself and Jennifer, uh, can you confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, I can. Okay, just checking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, the customer experience manager for Hypothesis. So I present workshops, one-on-one -on -one, um, guidance, that kind of thing. And I am happy to be here with Jennifer Young, who is the finance officer and a higher ed instructor at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, Jennifer is also the 2023 Social Learning Innovator Award recipient um, that Hypothesis um, awards to a faculty and instructors who are really doing amazing things with social annotation in their own classroom. So we are super excited to have Jennifer Young here and really thankful um, that she's willing to share what she's found on RSI and student grades from her own work in the classroom. All right, um, so let's go ahead and dive in. I am going to provide a brief inter uh, introduction before I uh, hand the slides over to Jennifer. And I am, and Jennifer, I'll advance the slides for you. Um, you. Just a just a note, um, if you're unfamiliar with hypothesis and social annotation, um, annotation provides information, shares commentary, sparks conversation, expresses power and aids learning. And that's a quote from Rami Clear and Antero Garcia's annotation um, book from MIT Press, um, big advocates of social annotation, which is a, a digital, generally happens through a digital tool. It's reading and thinking together on a digital document or digital text. Um, so rather than keeping annotation individual where maybe a student is marking up their own file um, or even on a physical copy of a textbook, making notes in the margins, what social annotation does is, um, and usually, through this digital tool process. It allows students to see and interact with what their peers have written or highlighted. And I would also include instructor comments and questions allowed um, also. Uh, so there's uh, this interaction among everyone in the class and there are ideas being shared and knowledge being co-created in that space, um, what we call the liquid margins. 
And for those unfamiliar um, to Hypothesis, this is a specific social annotation tool that allows you to work with more than just text. Uh, so uh, students can not only make quality comments um, by typing up their questions and reactions to a digital reading, for instance, but they can also annotate um, using multimedia functionality within those um, within those comments and annotations, and they can annotate different kinds of content, including web pages, videos, and podcasts with transcripts, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's just a kind of brief overview of what annotation is and what social annotation specifically is. And I will hand it off to um, Jennifer to talk a little bit more about what this looks like in terms of regular and substantive interaction and student grades. Um, I did want to note since um, there are uh, probably people here because of RSI and that kind of keyword that especially uh, distance educators and online teachers are interested in, um, that's a word uh, or a phrase that kind of guides how we should be designing online and distance classes. And for those who may be unfamiliar, the Department of Ed guidance regarding regular and substantive interaction breaks it up into two ideas. Um, the first is that, or that regular term, which is referring to regular predictable interaction between students and instructors in that classroom space. And substantive interaction has to do with this idea of direct instruction, um, direct feedback, um, to a student and amongst the classroom and direct facilitation. So all of these ideas, this um, combination of substantive interaction and regular inter interaction can all be supported by social annotation and hypothesis as a social annotation tool. So I just wanted to clarify um, those couple of terms before I hand it off to Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Jessica, for that great introduction. Um, I have been involved with the hypothesis tool and hypothesis community for a couple of years now, and I've been teaching for nine with the University of Alaska. And one of the things that came up in the last couple of years was this um, theory or rules about regular and substantive interaction that RSI and it was the accreditation um, council that came through and said this is something that needs to be done in all classes not just the face-to-face -face synchronous but also the asynchronous so the struggle was how do you take um, a asynchronous no interaction course and have regular and substantive interaction and the previous ideology was to use a discussion board and in my personal experience, and I think in other experiences of, of peer instructors as well, the discussion boards were just not well accepted and utilized by students. If they responded at all, it was um, perfunctory and very limited in scope. And a lot of times it was just checking a box, um, not necessarily on time, uh, very short responses. It did little to encourage participation of the class. It did little for the instructor and the students to get to know one another and just wasn't real useful. So when the idea of hypothesis came around, I thought, well, this is the same time that RSI is happening. So let's go ahead and see what happens. So in all my courses, I teach five different courses. I use RSI on a weekly basis and it's based on the chapters that we're reading. So the students will read the chapter together and they will have to make comments on that chapter. As they're going through throughout the week and putting those comments on there, I'm also going through and challenging them. So I'm asking questions directly about the material that if they don't read the material, they're not going to be able to answer. Um, if they post something that maybe is, is surface level and, and I want them to dig a little bit deeper and increase their knowledge, I'll challenge that and say, hey, let's let's do a little bit more research or what do you think about this or have you found anything that supports those ideas? Uh, the students through this engagement from the instructor 
have started engaging more and more with others as well. So they're asking questions of others based on the content. Like, I need more clarification on this. They're asking for assistance with homework, having a real hard time with this formula or this problem example. Can you help me? So it provides an opportunity for the students to get to know each other, build that community that you would see in a face-to-face -face classroom. But it also provides more opportunities for myself as an instructor to engage with those students. So, um, We've put out a white paper about this, and I presented at the Hypothesis uh, conference quite a while ago with my colleague LJ. And some of the information on these following slides is what we found, but the analytical data was the RSI, the regular and substantial interaction between the instructor and students, students and students, increased 1,400 to 2,100%. So what that translates into is the average student posted 30 to 39 times more annotations uh, over the course of the semester. And uh, failure rates decreased from five to 33%. And there is a very large gap there, but uh, the classes I teach are business law, employment law, income tax, records management, and investing. So there's a wide range of um, opportunities to succeed and or fail based on just the difficulty of the content itself. So that's why you're seeing that range. Um, and four to 24% of students increased their course grades because they had other people pushing them. They had almost instantaneous feedback to any questions they had. And they knew that if they didn't understand it, there was someone that they could reach out to. And I think that that translates well from the analytical data. All right, Jessica, you can probably change to the next one. So takeaways, I probably touched on some of these points already, but student engagement increasing exponentially, uh, student success in courses and improving, and the engagement between the instructor and fellow students is wonderful. And what I'm seeing in here and what it's proving um, is that students are reading material and they're demonstrating an understanding. They have to read the material to engage in this way. And that was something I wasn't seeing before. I think that a lot of them were using um, AI, they were using the homework uh, programs that give them the answers. And you could definitely see that they weren't really progressing in their knowledge throughout the semester. And this has really changed that. And I see a lot more analytical thinking and application of the concepts that we're learning in their work. All right, so um, some of you may have questions about how do I get this, these quality annotations? So I've been kind of playing back and forth with a number of different tools. Um, what I have found seems to work the best is requiring a set number of annotations. They have to post at least four annotations on each subject. Um, I do have guidelines for those four annotations, but past that, it's really up to them how much they want to engage. And um, a lot of them come back and post a lot. Some of them post the bare minimum. And I think there probably is a correlation between those success rates and the course grades based on that level of activity and involvement. But um, the first thing that I do is I ask them to create a question and an associated answer based on content. Uh, this is a little self-serving, but it also makes them think about it. So they have to come up with a question based on the content they have to provide an associated answer. And I've told them, we're gonna build this class as we go. So I have taken some of those questions and answers and incorporated it into the homework or the quizzes, things like that. Um, so they're seeing that it's being utilized again, but it also helps to avoid that homework copying plagiarism issue that a lot of instructors are seeing. But it makes them think um, how they would do that. Thank you. Uh, two is provide a considerate response to a question posed by the instructor. So I will go through, I'll read the chapter. Um, sometimes the, the publisher has revisions and I'll have to go through it a couple of times. But I go through, I ask questions, they answer it. Sometimes I'll challenge them further. All right, go ahead and to number three. This one is post a link to an article or a video that increases peer knowledge or helps to explain a concept along with an explanation of the relation. So you can go out to YouTube and find 
a video on the kitty tax, for example, and you can post that on there. But I want to know that they've watched the video and I want to know what in particular is related to the text and what content quality they got out of it. So what did they get from watching the video that's going to be a benefit to the other students in the class? Um, I have recycled these into the resources for each chapter as time has gone on after vetting them. And um, Hypothesis, you can also now uh, use for videos too. So you can add that as a supplemental to their learning. And number four is post and or respond to student inquiries and requests for help. So I'll go on, I'll answer these questions. I will pose questions. Do you understand this? This is what it is. Here's some tips or tricks, but it helps. For example, I work in Tennessee, my students are in Alaska, there's a four hour time difference. And so they're getting those answers that they need immediately, as opposed to me waiting to wake up in the morning and, and get online and respond. Okay. All right, this is back over to Jessica. Oh, you're muted still. Thank you. Um, so Jennifer has uh, gone over some great ways that social annotation intersects with um, regular and substantive interaction. It sounds like you're able to regularly provide feedback to students using the tool and using social annotation. And there's also this kind of direct feedback and facilitation um, and instruction that happens not just in your main learning materials, but also in those annotations themselves on their reading, um, which is great um, and a way for other faculty and instructors to think about social annotation and how it can support RSI. Um, just as a summary, here are some additional um, ways to think about how to ensure social annotation activities are successful. And we also, I should say, have some great resources on the educator resources um, site on the Hypothesis website. Um, so, and actually, um, Jennifer referenced a few of these, but uh, one of them is what we call seeding and feedback. So with um, social annotation and digital tools, you as the instructor can add comments and questions to your reading before students arrive at that reading. Um, so you can kind of provide what kind of um, markers or kind of signposting to provide to students as they are moving through the text. You can also um, provide questions to them. So when they arrive at the reading, open up the tool, um, they see these questions that you're al already um, wanting them to engage with upon their first um, interaction with the reading. Um, and through that, you are providing some modeling to students about what annotations um, and annotated, annotation replies should look like. Uh, one great thing to uh, maybe consider is creating examples. Um, so uh, you could potentially create um, an example of a set of annotations, have students um, provide feedback on those. So kind of a, a meta cognitive type of assignment where students are evaluating the quality of, of some sample annotations before they begin their own work. Um, but Throughout the semester, you'll find that as students gain more practice with the tool, um, they will also become more confident um, with their writing and um, they will be uh, become stronger annotators in the margins as well. Um, and then finally, and this also intersects with the idea of universal design for learning, um, you might consider giving students more agency by offering them multiple options and examples of things to annotate. Um, so perhaps you have um, a YouTube video transcript up for annotation that complements another reading that you've assigned. Uh, maybe you allow them to choose which material um, to uh, annotate as long as they are achieving that learning outcome that you're desiring. And this is allowing them to make choices about how they engage with course materials, again, allowing them a bit more agency in decisions that they make about um, their learning in, in your classroom. So those are just some kind of um, 
additional ideas for how to ensure successful annotation in the classroom, um, additional student and en engagement, and in that way, uh, further supporting RSI and student success and uh, student grades in that way. Um, so right now we are actually going, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we are going to um, go into a short Q&A session with Jennifer. So I'll be asking her um, some questions about her experience with social annotation in her uh, classroom. And uh, just a reminder that we do have time reserved after this for uh, answering questions from the audience. So if you do have questions for Jennifer um, or our team, feel free to add those to the Q&A and you'll find that at the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A button that you can press um, and add your questions to, and we will answer those as a team live. So let me, um, let me go ahead and begin with our with our questions here. So in your presentation, Jennifer, you noted that students' comprehension and engagement improved. Um, I'm wondering if you can elaborate on specific examples or feedback from the students that relates to comprehension and engagement. Okay. Um, I think the one that the course that I guess provides the best example of this is the income tax one. It is um, full of calculations, it's full of mathematics. And if they're working through the um, chapters themselves, there will be examples and it will have you know, the calculations listed. If students aren't understanding what appendix that gets pulled from or aren't understanding um, the order that the calculations need to be completed in, they will go in there and typically post, I I'm not quite understanding where this number comes from. Can somebody help me? A lot of times they'll link into that appendix that's in the course text um, or they'll, they'll link it as a PDF that you can click on. And a lot of times they're explaining the order of operations for mathematical calculations, that sort of thing. So um, I'm seeing that not only on examples in the textbook, but they'll work through the homework and they'll go into the annotation and say, hey, I'm having problems with chapter four, example five. Can anybody help with this one? And they'll immediately jump on and say, this is how I solved it but if you can think of a better way, let me know. Or yes, I'm struggling with that too. Professor, can you weigh in on it? So I'll come in and I'll say, yep, this is exactly what you need to do. And it helps multiple people. And it helps me from not having to go in and send multiple emails to the same person. And they're not afraid to ask each other those questions because they're interacting so much that they're, they have a familiarity with each other how they think, and a lot of times who to reach out to as that best resource. I was wondering, as you were talking, if you can say more about the kind of content that you use. So are you using like a, a PDF version of a textbook or what sort of in, uh, materials do you pull into the tool for students to annotate with? Um, I am using a PDF of the textbook. A lot of publishers are not super, super friendly with Hypothesis yet. I'm hoping and I'm thinking that I've seen some, some information that that's going to change, which would be wonderful. Um, but you do have to go in and you do have to create a PDF of the text. Um, I create groups that only are added to when I know that the student has purchased the textbook. So we don't have any sort of copyright issues that go along with that. So I'll put them in the group once I know that everything is, is okay and that they can be added. So what they can do is they can go in and they can read the text through the annotation. They can read it through the textbook itself, whether it's an e-text or a hardback version and come back and annotate it, whichever one is the best option for them. Thank you for clarifying that. And I just wanted to help others understand what kind of content can be um, pulled in. Um, my second official question is, how <laughs> did you measure the impact of social annotation on student success and interaction? So were you kind of counting annotations or were you like looking um, further into you know, what was included in the annotations, that kind of thing? 
So the analytical data that I used um, that was presented earlier in the, the short slide, so was very much based on just the numbers. Uh, it was how many annotations they made in a discussion board versus how many annotations they made on an actual annotation um, assignment. So we did see that big jump in those numbers. I mean, we're, we're almost 40 extra posts per student, which is wonderful. Um, but I also looked at the quality of those, and it's not really something that you can identify other than saying that the qu quality increased. Um, and I think that's reliant on what you do as an instructor as well. If you just say annotate something, the students aren't going to respond well to that. And you're going to have very much the same situation as the discussion board. I think it's really the the instructor interaction, those continual, what do you think about this, pushing your students just a little bit further and pushing for just a little bit more engagement. The modeling that you had mentioned earlier is a huge example as well. If I go in and just put why question mark, they're not going to respond to that as well as it's if it's if I say um, X, Y, and Z happened, these are the ramifications. What do you think would happen if it was Z, Y, X instead? And prompt that a little bit more so that they have to really think about it and apply that knowledge. And you're going to get more quality from that sort of interaction. Thanks. Those are great points. And um, so I'm I'm thinking about the ways that the ways that in class facilitation using open ended discussion and, and questions and follow up questions to students. Um, a lot of those things uh, instructors and faculty already practiced with um, and basically you're just kind of moving that kind of approach to um, your own replies and questions as an instructor in in a more I guess digital environment yes <laughs> it sounds like um, so like the quality of questions that you are asking is hopefully eliciting more quality interactions from students. Um, and then in turn, they are able to watch you modeling that kind of inquiry and begin engaging those kinds of um, kind of, I guess, practices on their own and in, in their own annotations. Um, so that, that sounds great. Um, so this may, may, relate or overlap with a previous question, but um, your abstract mentions that RSI in your courses increased by um, 1,400 to 2,100 percent. So we're comparing uh, kind of the frequency of student interaction in static discussion boards versus these um, more responsive conversational annotation environments. Um, so and you may have already referenced some of this, but what specific changes in student behavior contributed to this increase in interaction? I'm thinking, you know, if you're giving them a certain requirement, um, obviously they're gonna try to fulfill that, like maybe a couple of replies, but it sounds like there are students who are going kind of um, doing even more than what you were requiring. Um, and I'm curious um, about that as well. Um, I think the changes that I saw that I would say is most significant, um, and this was discussed in, in the, the conference presentation, was this tool is so dynamic that if you have involvement of all of the stakeholders, you are going to see a community form. People are seeking out communities. This, they can't go to a face-to-face -face classroom. Most of my students are, are extremely non-traditional. They work when their kids go to bed. They work when um, they're eating dinner. And they don't have time to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. So this is taking the place of that. And I think they're enjoying that adult interaction. They're enjoying the intellectual challenges that others are, are kind of putting out there, um, both the instructors and the peers. And I think it's just that desire to come together to learn more. And um, it's spurred by this, the requirements, obviously. You want to get the points for the assignment. Um, you want to make sure that you bear, meet the bare minimum. But once they go in there and they say, oh, well, I've got three responses to what I posted on there. I'm going to respond back. I think that's really the motivating factor. 
That's that's great. I love that reference to the um, what I've seen some people call the new traditional student. Um, so um, students who have families, have full time jobs, who are are doing their work in a kind of asynchronous environment um, where they're maybe working at, on their things at night or um, when they come home from work, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, since this is part of the, the topic for today, so not just RSI, but also student grades, um, curious how the increases in interaction translate to improvements in student grades and a reduction in failure rates. Um, and specifically, you know, I know you referenced like if there are certain requirements around the annotation assignment, students are going to um, want to fulfill those in order to, um, you know, get the grade that they want to get. <laughs> um, but also uh, that kind of, I think in the previous um, presentation, you re referred to it as a community of practice. How might that kind of relate to the grade performance and reduction in failure rates as well? I think that the community of practice um, is definitely a very strong link to their success. Uh, they're getting that that feedback back that from the other students that they're looking for. Um, but I think the the biggest correlation that I can make is they're actually reading the material. They're being forced to read the material. They're being forced to. Um, prove to others in the class that they understand the concepts, especially like the calculations, because they're answering those questions for others or posing those questions. So before where you could go to, um, Chegg is the one I think of all the time, but I know that there's a number of other different platforms. You can copy and paste the answer, not without a problem, but can you explain how they got to that answer? And they can't. So this kind of take some of that out of the equation. Um, so they're, they're being forced to learn it, it much more so than they were previously. And it's, it sounds a little mean when, it, when you say it like that, but um, if you poll college students, I have a college student myself, she has not bought books since her freshman year and she's a senior. So I know that she hasn't read them. Um, so it's nice to see they have to read them. They have to engage with them. There's a reason why we have a textbook because it has that content in there that we're trying to learn and to teach and to apply to your future careers. And they're using it and that's what they're doing. And that also speaks to the way where uh, if you are using like an open education resource textbook and you've made it available to students, even if it is free, um, students are not necessarily reading it um, because it's free to them or it, you know, it can be widely available. Maybe cost is not a barrier in that instance, but you as an instructor may find challenges routing students back to the digital text on their screen. Um, so the kind of social annotation and the assignment parameters are requiring them to go back to the reading and mark specific passages, that kind of thing. Um, I do see a note in um, our Q&A uh, about specific examples. Um, I'll try to get to those during our um, discussion and perhaps um, one of our facilitators can drop in a link to maybe a YouTube video or a web page on our site um, that shows kind of a, a demo of how the hypothesis tool works. Um, but essentially we are uh, loading a PDF or a piece of um, a text based file um, into Canvas or D2L or whatever LMS and students are selecting text um, and making an annotation upon that text. And I'll try to briefly, briefly show a, a screen of that um, in, in Q&A. Um, and thank you for your comments and questions. We will, I will reserve time um, for answering those in a couple of minutes here. Um, okay, so you've talked a lot about, Jennifer, you've talked a lot about, you know, things that went well um, as you are using this tool to, kind of guide students back to the text, um, 
make them read and troubleshoot and think about the concepts together. Um, I would also like to know um, more about the challenges um, and then um, maybe even before you used social annotation, what challenges you faced in maintaining RSI in your online courses um, before you used um, social annotation. So I'll split that into two parts. First, before you ado adopted the tool um, and social annotation in your courses, what challenges did you face with um, maintaining RSI in your online courses? Um, so the discussion boards, you obviously have your introductory week assignments and they post, they answer questions. Why are you in this class? Who are you? That sort of thing. Um, it's boring. <laughs> So I tried all sorts of things. I said, you know, make a video, um, do a recording, um, make a comic strip, introducing yourself, that sort of thing. Post a picture. Uh, there was there were some times where people would do it, sometimes that they wouldn't. Um, those ones usually I got quite a bit of involvement from, but um, I did have some people whenever there was any sort of personal component to it who shied away for it for whatever reason, um, abuse situations, things like that is what comes to mind. Uh, but it was, it was difficult to come up with what I felt was valuable enough topics that you could just put one prompt and get enough from everybody that you could have various answers that would still apply. So it, it was just, it was hard. Um, and you can record lectures, you can record videos, you can post them on there, but really the only um, interaction that you received past that point was emails or office hours that you would receive from students. And it was the ones typically who were doing fairly well in the course, but just had questions. Um, and you weren't reaching the students who were really struggling because they didn't know how to answer, the, ask the questions, um, didn't have time to to ask the questions, whatever it might be. So um, that was kind of the before experience, I should say. Um, but in terms of, of difficulties, kind of making that transition over, um, I really had to think about, and I'm gonna plug this, but the Hypothesis Academy, I took two of the different um, courses that were available and working with peers, it helped you kind of formulate um, how you wanted to outline those responses, what you were looking for from your students and what you wanted out of them and how to, how to, to form those annotation assignments to kind of pull that out of them. So that was really, real, really helpful. Um, have I gone through and made PDFs of multiple chapters multiple times? Absolutely. Um, you learn about making groups, you learn different things that just uh, your LMS system has to be handled a certain way to, to make it all work together. But it wasn't something that was really difficult to do. So with that help, I think that it's, it's fairly easy. That's good to hear. And thanks for plugging Hypothesis Academy. So if you are wanting an experience um, and are part of our uh, partner schools, um, Hypothesis Academy is a pretty um, low time commitment two week session where you practice using the tool and discuss using the tool, different pedagogical ideas, um, assignments, approaches, that kind of thing. And our next one actually begins on October 1st. And I'll say more about that um, as we wrap up at the end of the hour. Um, I actually want to jump into Q&A early because we do have several questions coming in. Um, and so, and then if we have time and those questions are answered, then I'll jump back into our um, in our Q&A, our official Q&A, Jennifer, if that's okay. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. Um, and some of these are related more to like the technical aspects of hypothesis. So I'll try to answer, save some time um, in about 10 minutes here to answer those. I'm gonna jump down to a couple of these. Um, so one participant says, I haven't used, um, oh, let me just, I'll get to that one in a bit. Um, 
How do you score in terms of your own time management or optimization? Um, and I think maybe uh, maybe this relates to like how how do you decide how frequently to jump into the student conversation in the margins? Um, uh, like what does that kind of uh, regular instructor interaction look like for you, perhaps? And then, and then, um, do you use a rubric to score responses, or or how do you handle scoring the annotations? Um, I hop in daily on all the courses that I teach, and I just peruse that particular chapter that we're on for the week. Um, typically, I have anywhere from 10 to 20 responses per day. It doesn't take a lot of time to uh, respond to those, and many of them is just monitoring conversation between the students themselves. It doesn't necessarily mean that I need to, to jump in or comment. So I really just kind of go through and say, is there room for a little bit of growth here? Um, is Does a question need to be answered? Does somebody need a little bit of help or some steering? Um, I do not use a rubric to score the responses. If they meet the criteria that I that I put out there, they get full points for it. Um, I did try that with the discussion board and it was quite a bit of a nightmare um, to develop a rubric that I wanted um, from students versus what they were capable of. And, and I know a lot of instructors online will probably understand that there's this um, level of writing that you expect from college students. And we're seeing a lot of levels that are much lower than that. Um, so it can be difficult if you have any sort of, of writing quality uh, in your rubrics. It's very difficult for some students. Thanks for, for sharing that. And let's see. Um, you mentioned using this with groups in your LMS. Um, Jennifer, I'm not sure if you did. And if you didn't, I can yes. try to answer that one. But did you find that there was an ideal small group size for annotations? I haven't ne needed to utilize the small group setting at this point in time. Um, I have been kind of kicking around the idea of creating um, some juries and running like mock trials for my business law course, um, in which case I'd probably use a group size related to the size of a jury. But in most cases, all students that are enrolled in the course are in there. If you have multiple sections, then you're probably gonna want to have um, one group for each section so that they can interact with each other. Great, and just from um, my own workshops um, and presentations, I'm generally saying about five to eight students for a small group, um, but it, it does depend on the how dense the reading is, how short or long it is, um, you know, what kind of space there is to distribute annotations across the text. Uh, so all of those are considerations that you as the instructor can make as you're setting up those, those group sizes. Um, and uh, there's an earlier question, um, and you may have answered part of this already, Jennifer, but do you make annotation a graded assignment? Does it replace the discussion board or both? Um, you, you mentioned uh, a little bit about rubrics, uh, but uh, this, this might also be helpful to other participants. So have you found like there's a, a number, a set number of annotations that really kind of kicks off um, the conversation um, and helps with the academic depth of the discussion, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so anything uh, about those items would be helpful. I do make it a graded assignment. Um, it is only eight points every um, reading. So it's not a very, very large amount, but it's enough that it can make a difference between an A or a B or a C if they're working on all of the different chapters. Um, I also include a discussion post for that introductory one only because I find it's it's very difficult to annotate something with an introduction. Um, but there's not as many points assigned to that. It's just making sure that they're logged in and actually working on the material. Uh, what I do at the beginning to kind of teach them how to annotate to get them familiar with the concept is I do a syllabus annotation where they have to go through ask questions about it. It verifies that they know what the course schedule it is. They know what the requirements are. And the only thing I ask them to annotate on there is 
tell me at the end, I've read the entire syllabus. So then I have in writing, <laughs> I have read it and I understand what this course is going to be and I'm ready for it. Um, so those are, those are things kind of that I, I use, but I do, as I said, use the discussion board for that introductory post, usually only. Thank you. Um, I am going to switch into a quick um, slide uh, really quickly to show two of our um, participants a, a visual, um, and then I'll switch back into the question about AI that is appearing in chat. Um, so I'm just going to briefly, and this is very impromptu, so um, if you are interested in learning more about hypothesis, we have a, a quick start in Canvas next week, actually. Um, and then we will continue to have um, various kinds of workshops um, where you'll see a, a more full demo. But it does look like there's a few people who do have questions about the, what this looks like, practically speaking. Um, so this is a old present, not old presentation, but a presentation that I use for um, D2L Brightspace, uh, so just ignore anything referencing D2L Brightspace. This is what it will look like um, for you in whatever LMS that you use. So you load a PDF or a website, in this case on your main screen, you see a website here. Um, this grading bar is specific to D2L Brightspace, uh, so ignore that. Um, in Canvas, it appears in, in SpeedGrader. Um, so the main screen, you'll see you're reading, and on the right-hand side, you see the annotations. Um, so students select text from the website or from the PDF, and a menu appears. They press annotate, and then they can type up their response. Um, so that's hopefully um, there was someone asking for a specific example in a screen. So hopefully that helps ground this a bit more um, in a visual. And then there was also a question about what this looks like for uh, videos and YouTube videos specifically. And this is what that would look like in your LMS if you were um, incorporating a YouTube video. So the YouTube video appears on the left, the tool pulls the um, auto-generated or human-generated transcript that's been loaded to YouTube, and then um, students uh, select text from the transcript itself and make um, annotations that way. Um, so I'm gonna not gonna belabor uh, this and and make it a full demo, but um, hopefully that helps um, with those couple of questions that came up. And now I'm going to um, loop back to the other Q and A. So. Have you found any attempts by students to use AI making annotations? If you have, um, how did you handle that? Okay. Um, I have been through a number of trainings on AI and we've really as an institution been thinking about hand, how to handle it. When I saw the most AI homework platforms, tools in general that they're using, um, it was through written work. So it's, you know, short essays, long essays, any sort of large discussion responses, but I am not seeing um, AI generated content in the annotations themselves. They're small enough that um, it's easy for the students to do as opposed to, to trying to search out something that's appropriate. Um, they're very subject specific. They're extremely linked to the content itself as you're reading it in that um, immediate dynamic setting. And so I just don't think that they're they're thinking of using that option because it's they have to read it anyway, so they might as just well respond. Um, and I I have seen AI in those other assignments, and it's one of those things that myself as an instructor have been struggling with how to handle that, but. Um, a lot of times it's it's very apparent when AI has been utilized. Thank you for that. Yes, I think that um, the fact that the tool requires students to open up the reading um, itself and at least select and view a paragraph or a sentence really helps guide them away from um, the tendency toward generative AI, if, if that is. Um, their preference. Um, we have a great comment from um, 
one participant, uh, I won't say your name out loud because uh, I don't know if you would prefer that, but they have a really helpful comment. Um, they love the syllabus annotation idea. Uh, they usually ask students to pick one thing in the syllabus that no one has identified and share why it's important to them. Uh, I love that idea. It, this person says it works super well. That also helps with this um, kind of need or um, thing you may want to do in your annotation assignments, which is to help distribute comments across the full text. So mm -hmm. if you do have this guidance to have students pick a thing that no one else annotated or identified yet, that can be helpful with that um, aspect of annotation. Uh, Jennifer, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, but I thought I'd mention it. I think it. it's a great idea. I hadn't thought about it either, but that would definitely smooth out some kinks that students have, yeah. Um, great, and I think that we're all caught up on the Q&A, um, so I will, Switch back to one or two more um, questions from our our official Q and A list here, and if any more questions come through, I'll try to get get to those as well. Um, so let's see. Um, what this is this is interesting to me as well. What best practices did you develop for structuring hypothesis-based assignments to foster real-time interactions? Um, and so, like, is there are there best practices that you created to help you know have students daily or every other day return to the reading, um, dissuading them from you know making their two comments and then never looking at the text again? The day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of my courses I use open deadlines for turn it in by the end of the semester. Um, that was kind of based on this uh, responding to the needs of my students because they'd have times where they could work ahead. There would be times that um, they just, they couldn't do it for whatever reason. So annotation, when I first started playing with it, experimenting with it, that was difficult because you couldn't respond and answer questions. So those are the only things during the semester that I have set deadlines on. So every week they have one or two chapters, depending on how much content is, is being reviewed that um, time frame. And yes, there are times where some people wait until the last minute, but they're not going to get their points unless they go in and they, they give those questions. They give those answers, whatever they need to do in response. Um, I think that it's worked out really, really well. You can access them early. And so those students that work ahead provide a lot of um, seed material for the ones that are responding in the appropriate week. So I think it's organic. I think you're going to always have somebody um, waiting till the last minute, but I've definitely seen, um, like I said, I think 10 to 20 posts a day. That's, that's quite a bit of interaction. So they're logging in for sure. Awesome. That's what we want to hear for a conversation about RSI. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll jump up, uh, jump to our wrap up here. Uh, but uh, maybe you could just say a little bit about what you heard from students themselves about their experience with the tool. Um, you know, did they like using it? Um, did they find it easy to use? Um, those sort of uh, whatever kind of feedback yes. you received from them? Uh, the first semester that I did this in my courses, every week I offered an extra credit um, assignment, just a couple points here or there, and it was, give me feedback on this week. Just, just give me feedback. Because um, I didn't know if I'd liked it. I didn't know if they liked it. And overwhelmingly, it was, this is so much better than discussion boards. It's nice to learn more about the people I'm in class with. I learned so much this week and my questions were answered super fast. So that in itself, I mean, I didn't, and it was week after week after week that it was the same sort of feedback. And that in itself coupled with the data um, proves to me without a doubt that this is something that has helped for my students. Um, something else that I'm seeing is I have students 
that are going through all of my courses because they take one and they're like, I really like how she does this. So then they take another one and then it's welcome back for another semester, you know, new content, but it's the same individuals. And so I'm building communities in those individual classes, but as a whole, I'm getting to know these students that I've never met face to face and I'm nominating for them for different awards and I can comment on who they are as students because I am seeing that continual involvement. That's awesome. So the reading groups and the community kind of carries Bob on from course to course because you're, yeah. you're inviting students back. They like they seem to like the tools and, and the way you teach mm -hmm. um, in that way. That that is really, really cool. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm going to bring up our um, wrap up slides here um, and Jennifer, I, I really appreciate you being here. I've, I've learned a lot about your course and um, online asynchronous courses sometimes have their challenges, um, but it sounds like using the social annotation tool, you've been really uh, able to provide solutions um, to students. Um, I did wanna mention to our participants here, we do have um, a, uh, some partner workshops coming up. So take a look at our website. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about how to use Canvas, um, the hypothesis in Canvas, that is, we have a quick start next week where I'll do a full demo of, of that. And then we have some special topics coming up in October for, so using annotation for large courses, STEM courses, um, incorporating research-based strategies, um, all of these things we do also now have a uh, partnership with Vital Source um, at select schools. So, uh, if you are interested in learning more about that, uh, feel free to check in and register for those. Um, I'll also, uh, just give a shout out to um, Hypothesis Academy starts on October 1st. So, if you're looking for that firsthand experience before or while you um, incorporate Hypothesis into your classes for the first time. Uh, do check that out and that is all uh, on our, our website as well. Um, and we do have a Kickstart uh, promotion, uh, which provides discounted pricing for first time users, uh, no cost implementation and a variety of other benefits, including um, free access to the Hypothesis Academy and workshops that I just mentioned. So do reach out to education at hypothesis.is to learn more. Um, and I just want to give Jennifer another last shout out. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with, with us. Uh, thank you so much to our participants for attending. And I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and our team is happy to um, answer questions at our, our email.